people are often said is uh, often say is easier to identify than it is to define. Partly, partly it's uh, it's hard to define because of its um, its diffuse nature. What we're talking about is a really a transpersonal ideological field, ideological atmosphere, um, to do with a certain form of acquiescence. Hi all, welcome to Theory Wave Nights, a regular show featuring art, performance and discussions around politics and theory. I'm joined today by regular co-host Adam Ray Atkins and new addition to the team, Mihai Moldovanu, for our first Beyond Linguistics reading group, where we'll be discussing parts one and two of Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto of 1848 and showing artworks and memes that we've made in response to it. Adam needs no introduction, but anyhow, I'll tell you he's an audio artist, poet and dank memester. Mihai Moldovanu is a multimedia visual artist who is currently responding to Mark Fisher's notion of acid communism. So without further delay, I'm going to throw us straight in here, bringing in Adam's artwork and ask him to discuss it in relation to his reading of parts one and two of the Communist Manifesto. Adam, over to you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Um, So I think just first very briefly wanted to recap that, yeah, the reason we're doing this is because well we are artists uh, mostly or existing within some relation to the art world and socialists or realist or existing in some relation to socialist ideas um so we wanted to kind of capture these books and transform them into different things like take the text and put it into image um to both make it more digestible to those who prefer to ingest images but also to transform it a bit and see like what's what we can find in the images that aren't there direct in the text, how it may have mulled over. Um, so this first one that I that you got pulled up is based on the first part, uh, just the bourgeois and the proletarians. Um, it to me, yeah, it is a landscape, and I think pretty easily identifiable um, if you just said the Communist Manifesto to someone is probably this uh, opening of it, a specter is haunting Europe. So this is my specter of communism in a way, in the center there. Um, He's over the landscape. And more so though, I wanted to capture this idea of proletarianization that I found within the first part of the manifesto. So the manifesto talks about the bourgeois and the proletarians. It explains what they are. And actually, I think a pretty pretty wonderful short explanation. Um, you know, it's only like, what is it? 10 pages or 12 pages? And it gets pretty deep. Um, for such an introductory text um, and explains these ways that the history of class struggle in societies, um, in a word, oppressor and oppressed, uh, is breaking down from more complex relations where there's so many multiple antagonisms into dividing basically into two. And then how the other classes are slowly becoming proletarianized, how this special labor becomes subsumed into the mode of wage labor. Um, So specifically, let me find my quote. Um, There's a couple quotes here that I really picked from to create the image. So the modern bourgeois society has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with class antagonisms. It has but established new classes, new conditions of oppression, new forms of struggle in place of the old ones. Our epoch, the epoch of the bourgeoisie, possesses, however, this distinctive feature. It has simplified the class antagonism. Society as a whole is splitting up more and more into two great hostile camps, into the two classes directly facing each other, bourgeois, bourgeoisie and proletariat. So that's pretty, you know, that's a pretty basic but important uh, distinction. And then it goes into a little bit later. um, It has resolved personal worth into exchange. 
and in the place of the numberless indefensible character infeasible character freedoms has set up that single unconscionable freedom free trade in a word for exploitation veiled by religious and political illusions it has substituted naked shameless direct brutal exploitation the bourgeoisie has stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honored and looked up in reverent awe it has converted the physician the lawyer the priest the poet the man of science into paid wage laborers um and so like there's kind of a negative aspect there in that but there's also a positive aspect in that in that it's simplifying these contradictions so also when i read that and then there was one more line um Differences of age and sex no longer have any distinctive social validity for the working class. All are instruments of labor, more or less expensive to use according to their age and sex. So this idea is like just upon reading that first section, I almost got these religious vibes. Like I kind of was reminded of um, what is that? In, in Christ, there is no Jew or Gentile, um, you know, no nationality, no East or West. So I took those concepts and kind of combined them for my piece. So you have the specter of communism in the center, and then on the sides, I have just blue and red um, skies, kind of signifying this division into two, but of course they're blurring into one another. Um, and on the blue side, I have reworked some of that and the text is, there is no physician nor dishwasher. There is no lawyer nor grocer. There is no priest nor redacted. There is no redacted nor redacted. And then, um, and by redacted, I do mean crossed out or obscured in some way. Um, and then on the red, you have the repeating refrain, they are all instruments. Um, so it says that one, two, three, four, five, six times, they are all instruments on the red hand side. So that passage into proletarianization. Um, then within the grass area, I have also hidden a couple phrases or words. Um, I've read it uh, hidden class antagonism has been simplified into two hostile camps. Um, and actually, I think that's it. That's all it says in the grass, but it's like kind of strewn about in there. Uh, probably not noticeable right away. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have about this one. I, I'm kind of happy with my specter. I think he looks both silly um, and horrific. Okay, thank you, Adam. So that's interesting. Great, uh, great artwork, great analysis, uh, bringing up a couple of points I'd like to explore a little more after we let uh, Mihai speak and show us his work. Um, but for now, let's just say this kind of turbulent sky that you talked about is, is really interesting because it, it kind of expresses in visual form very clearly uh, this, this sense of turbulence of some impending uh, major happening uh, or event described in the Communist Manifesto, this kind of sense that exactly that, that, that Europe is haunted by this scepter of communism, this uh, this uh, impending um, revolution that, that actually does, has never really arrived um, in any meaningful sense still. And so I guess it's still a scepter, uh, scepter spectre. I, I always get confused, but, you know, it's, it's still it's still there and it, it haunts us, um, haunts us maybe for our failure to actually realise it um, more than anything else. So... Um, I mean, with that in mind, let's just pass to Mihai and pick that up maybe a little later. Uh, hello, everyone, again. Uh, so I uh, want to say that um, I agree with uh, everything that uh, Adam said. And uh, I also I agree that the text, uh, although uh, quite small, and uh, I think uh, a lot of people uh, me myself, when when I first thinking about rereading it, I was thinking that it's going to be more um, propagandistic and more directed, say, to um, 
so kind of an audience that is uh, less uh, knowledgeable in, in uh, theory, uh, but uh, actually it's, it's very dense uh, and uh, it has a lot of really interesting ideas. Um, so uh, this quality of um, of capitalism to to destroy uh, existing uh, hierarchies in society uh, and uh, in this sense to create uh, a new hierarchy or uh, a new uh, class opposition is kind of the main part of the text uh, and uh, it's it's what uh, I personally was influenced the most when uh, I uh, made the artwork. Uh, so um, specifically, uh, just wanted to say about one quote, which kind of uh, sums up, I think, uh, Marx's position, uh, and also. Uh, that relates to the kind of the, the art communist uh, art movement or um, Mark Fisher's idea of art communism, uh, which is, um, I quote, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned, and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. So he talks about how uh, relationships in family are being uh, melted away, where uh, it becomes more obvious uh, that the, um, but by transforming the relationship in the family into this kind of uh, exchange uh, based on uh, uh, on money, uh, it becomes um, stripped away of all this content of uh, relationship like between father and family and kids and family. So it becomes more and more um, this thing of just uh, uh, of, of exchange of, um, of money and of, um, yeah. So, so we, we, could, uh, we, we could be kind of, um, we, we could be mournful about it and we could uh, want to return back. Uh, but uh, we could also be thankful to this uh, melting away uh, of hierarchies because as the quote says, it, uh, it makes us look at the real conditions of life uh, instead of looking at things through this uh, prism of uh, traditions and, uh, and and so on. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna say a few things about uh, the artwork. So the, um, this piece uh, I made uh, using uh, basically digital collage uh, of uh, a few images. So if you look at it, uh, you can see uh, in the fore foreground, uh, image of two person. Well, there's one woman at the bottom and another man. Uh, if you can, it's it's a bit less clear, but uh, another man on uh, a bit higher. Uh, and uh, as well, there is uh, I used one of my pictures of an industrial structure, which is kind of like the middle ground. And in the in the background, you can see some. Uh, structures, uh, scheme, sch schematic uh, drawings of uh, industrial structures. So uh, I used uh, basically a, a images taken from a Soviet magazine uh, for the foreground uh, and uh, for the background I used uh, some uh, drawings of uh, bread production, drawings from a bread production manual. So it's uh, also a Soviet manual on uh, basically how to produce bread, which has also this 
connotation of you know bread and the left um, so um, so at first when I read the text I found it uh, difficult to think of uh, what I could uh, make in terms of art but then uh, by making the piece of art uh, I think it helped me realize like uh, uh, what uh, I thought about the text so it kind of made me conceptualize the text better so in this sense I found it uh, really helpful so that's that's kind of it thanks okay so thank you Mihai some interesting points there um, reflecting on the whole what Adam said but I want to pick up on on, on, on two main issues um, that, that kind of go across both your your discussions there and and your artworks um, I mean we have we have two kind of sections really I think that have, have jumped out as being most important here in in the first two parts of the of the communist manifesto and there is first this this section where Marx basically describes how various professions have been perhaps made irrelevant so so there is no room anymore for the professional um, poet or or I think as, as he describes uh, if I can find this um, uh, the, the bourgeoisie is stripped of its halo every occupation hitherto honoured and looked up to with reverent awe so it's basically taken off its pedestal all of these kind of high professions and it's converted the position the lawyer, the priest, the poet the man of science into its paid wage labourers so I mean Adam's already quoted that uh, I just wanted to return to it and think about how Adam in, in his work uh, in his artwork, he's actually written on the left-hand side, as he already mentioned, that there is no uh, dishwasher, no lawyer, nor grocer. And he, and he says there's no, and then he says uh, the word's actually been erased. So uh, I forget the term he used, but um, uh, redacted. So there, there's no, and then actually this profession's completely erased from, from the discourse, and he's erased the word. Um, so we're dealing now with, with precisely that, I suppose, that actually the, the loss of, of occupations that we can't even really put our finger on. And this is something that's been ongoing since industrialization. So we, you know, we, we maybe even lost the awareness of, of certain crafts that, that once existed, uh, skills, knowledges of local uh, herbal medicine, wildflowers, um, local culinary skills, languages even. That, that perhaps aren't conducive or necessary to the global capitalist order. Um, and then you have now this situation under, under lockdown with the coronavirus of, of jobs literally disappearing and it not being clear if they'll reappear. So capitalism as a, as a kind of disruptive force that levels, because it gets away, gets away from this kind of distinction of the craftsman who has certain skills who would have been schooled uh, in a guild um, as an apprentice, as a middle class person, um, it gets away the distinction between that and the industrial labourer, uh, which in a sense uh, could be seen as positive, but of course is, is at the same time hugely negative because it, it gets us, it, it kind of strips us of creative skills and powers that in a sense make us human. Um, I just want to get to, to what Mihai was focusing on there. Um, which is more oriented towards this this um, this quote, everything that's solid, all that's solid melts into air. So again, this kind of disruption that things we once held dear um, evaporate. Um, but you know that that evaporation, or not being something that is entirely freeing from from solid rigid structures, that it actually brings along other capitalist structures. And I just want to touch here on this kind of quite common. Uh, how can we say interpretation of Marx that comes up uh, in discussions with academics and that is the observation that look I mean Marx yeah he, he was a communist but he wasn't anti-capitalist um, there were these kind of inherent contradictions where Marx actually wanted to kind of ride out capitalism to then push it up to a certain point of, uh, of competence uh, and then overtake its its tools to then redistribute the wealth it had amassed 
um, to the working classes who would then kind of operate it on behalf of everyone in, in, in a fair way. Um, okay, so this is an issue anyway that we don't know how that would ever happen. So Marx didn't get to write how he envisaged um, a kind of dictatorship and a proletariat uh, emerging into a utopia without instead becoming what we later saw uh, in Stalinist Russia, for example. Um, but aside from that point, you know, I think that the semantics are often are often uh, all wrong here. The, 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 as was said by the late curator of the Venice Biennial uh, Biennale um, 2015, this huge international art fair, uh, art event that happens in, in Venice every two years. The curator, now departed, uh, Okwi Emwazor, uh, was actually um, interviewed by the Guardian newspaper as he had made, well, as he was the curator of this huge international biennial, but also um, because he had made the biennial focused around Marx's capital. So we had daily readings of Marx's Das Kapital in this kind of art event, this huge international event that attracts mostly, to be fair, uh, wealthy people to go and see it. Um, and he had in the main pavilion readings of Marx, he had, he had videos of David Harvey talking about Marx, he had works interpreting Marx. Okay, all good, but in this interview, it really feels like he dropped the ball, like somehow he let us down. He says to the Guardian interviewer, um, look, I mean, if, if Marx was alive today, I don't think he'd want capitalism to end. And I can see where this comes from, because we haven't maybe reached the conditions to realise uh, communism. We do have some kind of positive uh, signs, uh, the internet, um, OK, not maybe the best moment to make this point, but the best medical care we have seen in terms of what's possible. Um, and if we keep pushing this through, perhaps in some kind of accelerationist uh, way, uh, we could get to a, a, a society ripe for then co-opting uh, and, 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 and converting into communism. But I think this is, this is not to say that Marx didn't want cap. The Mar the Mar sorry, the Marx wanted capitalism. Uh, this is a total obfuscation and I think something that helps academics kind of wield their knowledge over non-academics. Uh, you know, they could say, ah, well, yeah, you know, you say Marx wanted to finish capitalism, but actually um, capitalism is somehow seen as intrinsic to, to an eventual utopia. I mean, to me, it's, it's more than blatant that the Communist Manifesto is an anti-capitalist book that wants by all means to bring an end to capitalism. It simply approaches capitalism in a pragmatic way that realises its potential in comparison to eras of feudalism and slavery and wants to kind of leverage that potential to bring an end to that very system itself and to all systems of domination because Marx actually says in the manifesto, section one, that domination has always existed, that hierarchy has always existed. So it's kind of a case of looking at what we have and going, OK, how do we utilise what we have to bring about something completely different? Because simply, you know, one has to start from where they are. So I think we really need to stop any talk of like, actually Marx talked up the huge potential of capitalism um, because if that was the case, he'd just have been a capitalist, and quite clearly he's he's not. Um, in that light, I just want to also point out the huge extent to which it's evident that Marx sees a loss of craft and creative skills as intrinsic to capitalism, that capitalism functions by ridding people, as I hinted at earlier, of their capacity to make meaningful objects that imbue life itself with a meaning. So it's kind of a, a despiritualizing of the world. And he goes into this actually in, in Capital later on, uh, Das Kapital, section one, part one. Um, but, you know, basically the, the Marx sees capitalism as making humans themselves into objects. Um, so, so the kind of the quest to make more objects, to make more stuff, to gain more stuff is, is achieved at the expense 
of humanity itself. Okay, um, he doesn't really ever study and go into the importance of of art, of craft skills, of stuff one makes with their hands through studying and through a through an intense consideration of the object. Um, it's just hinted out here in the Communist Manifesto and hinted at more strongly at parts of the uh, 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 of Das Kapital, of Capital. Um, I think that, you know, really, we're getting on to Adorno in a couple of weeks. We're going to be talking about Theodore Adorno and Horkheimer's uh, dialectic of enlightenment. The, the, the reason that Adorno wrote and Horkheimer wrote, and the reason the Frankfurt School, of which they were a part, uh, wrote about creativity, about the media, about culture, is because they saw a need to supplement Marx's understanding with a cultural interpretation that wasn't to dismiss Marx, it was just to try and eke out more of what Marx was already pointing to in a fundamental failure of capitalism towards a human being by stripping that human being of meaningful creative activity. And this is fundamental because what Marx is basically looking at, as was Hegel, as is Adorno later, is a relationship between the subject and the object, the subject being a human and the object being everything material, everything existing outside the human, and the, the need for for us to somehow ameliorate that relationship, to, to find a comfortable relationship between a human and non-human, and, and the mistake often in societies of um, trying to kind of get around the, the gap between the, the, the human and, and nature and everything outside it by basically subjugating nature directly to the human but ending up in doing that, subjugating the human to objectivity itself. So humans become objects in the game, sought to dominate objects. Um, the thing about creative production is is that you know one is forging a pact with the object. If you've ever painted, uh, made sculpture, even made memes, because we, when we make internet memes, we're still using physical objects, i.e. the computer um, and kind of visual objects. Um, you know, we're in a position of, of, of reaching a pact with the object and that's what uh, is being lost when you go from various crafts and the guilds, the communities that surround these crafts that Marx is talking about being dismantled by capitalism. That's what's at stake and that's what one loses. Um, so I think one has to be careful um, again in interpreting Marx and, and in giving too much over to a materialist view and casting art as a semi-spiritual kind of occupation but actually you know one is not talking about um, you know the idea that politics runs downstream from culture the idea that okay so Adorno and Horkheimer and Benjamin uh, they're all they're all talking about culture because they believe it's culture that dominates politics and economics and we're not talking about culture running downstream from economics and the idea that economics has to be fundamental and culture is something that's influenced by economics, they're actually very much entwined. That to achieve the capitalist machine, one had to subjugate culture, okay? Um, to achieve some kind of cultural event or happening that supersedes capitalism, one has to eke out uh, creative potential. Uh, one, one, one has to, at the same time to do that, they have to subjugate the capitalist machine, okay? Um, so, you know, this is why I want to talk about the Communist Manifesto and then the Dialectic of Enlightenment, because we get to kind of compare a more materialistic view with um, a kind of cultural outlook and then actually find, ultimately, I hope, that they're very much linked and that we need the materialist economic approach and we need the kind of cultural theorist approach, which touches upon uh, the kind of quasi-spiritual human aspect that needs to express itself. Okay, so aside from that, just looking at um, Mihai's work uh, and Adam's, so I'm going to look at both of them now, um, we see a high level of abstraction, which interests me. Okay, so there is this kind of abstraction uh, in Adam's what's well, actually a sky and some and some fields and grass okay so it's, it's actually landscape it's not fully abstract but there's an abstract element in the paintwork which I think kind of leads one into a state of reflection that one is not just looking 
at an object, one is somehow suspended, uh, somehow uh, caught in contemplation, not knowing exactly what they're looking at, which is reflected in Mihai's work here on the the the, the right, uh, and Mihai has basically taken this industrial structure uh, or, or various industrial structures, superimpose them. He has faint human figures. So he has things that are identifiable as something, but somehow so, so far distorted and abstracted that again, we're left wondering exactly what we're looking at, which is no bad thing in art. And I think it very much indicates art's potential in overcoming a basically over-rational system that, that reduces everything to uh, measurable quantities, to numbers and then effectively to wages and to profits. Um, I mean, the system needs things to be identified in order to manage them, package them, sell them, and and count and count the uh, according profit. Um, so you know, I think one one says, you know, what's the point in art? Art's useless, or somehow art, art has no concrete role in revolution. Well, its role is precisely perhaps because it's useless, and that's kind of the the importance of of discussing art alongside. Um, semi-sciences or sciences that aim to kind of really get to the truth um, is the kind of suspension of truth and not, not in a kind of post-truth Trumpian way but more in a, in a way that throws uh, conventional understanding upside down so that we can kind of reimagine new worlds and, and utopias. Um, so with that I leave Adam and Mihai to continue discussing uh, their observations and I'm going to come back at the end to discuss uh, the schedule for upcoming episodes okay thank you uh, go ahead guys all right yeah um so actually Miha I wanted to talk to talk about your piece a little bit um I found it interesting to hear you talk about how you made it uh, I really like it, and maybe, so, one thing I saw while looking at it, of course, you know, I'm thinking of it through this lens of the manifesto, what I had read, and I did get this thing of the hierarchies being dissolved because these industrial uh, images seem to be coming out of every direction, you know, they're, like, very, uh, the perspective seems off, right, like, it seems like they're falling or maybe being raised or coming from multiple angles. Um, but what I really also shined through to me was um, that, and I don't, I'm, I'm, so I'm curious about why you chose green, I guess, because when I saw that green and I saw these industrials, um, it, uh, structures and like the where they're fading into each other and they're layered on top of each other, I thought of the demands of the manifesto, which part two ends with like these, demands and i found it it's number nine is specifically what i thought of it says number nine the combination of agricultural with manufacturing industries gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country by a more equitable distribution of the population over the country um and i think that is probably the hardest um, and least addressed of all those demands. A lot of the demands in here are like exist on some level or more or less um, in more advanced capitalist bourgeois countries. Um, even like, you know, 20 years later, Marx had said some of that, um, that, you know, well, like America has a half of these demands um, when talking about the uh, Gaza program. Um, and yeah, so that's a that's always been an interesting one to me is that that melding of city and agriculture because I've lived in a lot of rural areas um, in my life. Yeah. So, anyways, that's uh, yeah that that's always been super interesting, and I think actually the fact that it's been so difficult uh, to achieve, if ever even tried to be achieved, um, in a realistic way speaks to something about it because what would it mean to really transform that you would have to completely change this mode of production 
that we're in where, you know, there wouldn't be that distinction. I don't think it means just throwing industrial plants in the middle of rural areas. You know, it's like this integration of sorts almost uh, mm -hmm. between those modes of life and between man and technology, not to sound like transhumanist or anything, um, but like a real like symbiotic relationship there between the agricultural and industrial, um, or maybe something beyond both of those. Uh, and then also quickly to talk about it, the, the figure that you have in the foreground, the woman, mm -hmm. um, and the woman is like kind of disappearing too. So I kind of took that as the proletariat um, in essence. So like the proletariat kind of disappearing as we've reached this state where the agricultural and manufacturing industries are less distinguishable from one another as um, society, as the mode of production is changing, you know, ultimately the idea is the proletariat will cease to exist um, after that because it is a product, uh, so to say, of capitalist society. So like the goal being that disappearance of the worker, of the proletariat, of all social classes, of all class antagonism. Um, and yeah, did you want to, could you say anything about that? Like were any of those coming through it, your mind? I find it really interesting uh, that you're reading uh, and it's much more in depth than uh, my uh, reading of it. Uh, uh, but uh, that, that's that's interesting. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna return uh, later to your uh, concern with, with the color green and, and how it uh, relates to the um, disappearance of towns and the distinction between towns and uh, villages. But I, I just want to say briefly about the, um, the color itself. Uh, it, I start, like for a while now I'm making uh, work based on a kind of Dadaist principles of chance. So, uh, but instead of cutting up uh, magazines, you know, which I still kind of do, but uh, I, I use the, um, the algorithms in Photoshop to put it more technically. So uh, based on how the layers interact with each other and many colors are accidental, uh, but I, so I wasn't really conscious about the colors when I did them, but Later on, like the palette is quite dark, and I, I gravitated towards that. And uh, to me, this kind of signified the disappear, uh, the the this uh, just in general the bloodiness of history. You know how this constant, uh, this constant subjugation, and uh, that is becoming in some. It's, it's becoming more brutal and more brutal where uh, people's uh, uh, thoughts are subjugated and people's feelings and so on in uh, late capitalism. Okay, thanks, Mihai. Just to come in there um, with my own work before I forget and before we, we wrap up and explain the schedule going ahead. Um, so this is my piece um, featuring Karl Marx, clearly, and he's wearing a, a face mask. Uh, one of the few of us may be able to get hold of a face mask right now. Uh, and the text says, the 172nd annual edition of the, Man of the Communist Manifesto carried an amendment, and then there's a quote, workers of the world self-isolate and unite. So uh, clearly a comment on our current situation. Uh, I don't know if it's one, one quarter of the world now under lockdown. Um, so this clearly presents problems in terms of the kind of uniting that Marx intended, people uniting around the workplace when so many of us actually aren't at work. And, uh, of course, when generally so many of us are itinerant workers who aren't unionised and who don't um, gather in workplaces. So that kind of poses an issue which which is kind of being addressed by creative workers at home, people may be sometimes already involved in online streaming, in meme making, uh, in YouTube video making, who are now up in their production or people who are beginning production and the positivity that arises from that as we see an increase in, in a kind of solidarity, in, 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 a, in a sense of being together 
even whilst we're alone. So we're facing this tragic position, but at the same time, we're we're responding with a kind of sense of positivity linked to an emergent possible underground and maybe uh, something that responds in, in, in a sense to Mark Fisher's unfinished uh, book, Acid Communism, where he talks about the need to to foster a new underground movement, a new sense of what it is to be working class. And, you know, I know there are limits to online production in terms of making revolutions, but it's something that I think if we if we upped the kind of activity online and whilst people are thinking a lot about the economy, about their jobs or lack of jobs, at some point in the future, we may be able to um, come out of uh, lockdown, emerge from lockdown with a whole lot of people who are deeply focused on issues that uh, aren't stood in part by by socialism or communism. So maybe we could channel some of that online unity into uh, in real life IRL activity. So there's a kind of a positive silver lining to our current predicament. I don't know how that kind of strikes anyone else here. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the creative uptake has been pretty amazing. Um, even myself, while I'm still working, I've uh, been doing projects with other people who are um, not able to do anything at this moment um, or maybe more full-time creative. Uh, and just, yeah, seeing the collaboration between people too. Um, I've seen especially that, an uptake in people wanting to connect through those creative processes, whether it be... Um, like streaming together, doing these conferences, um, doing uh, like almost like community building things where I've seen a lot of, so like uh, a musician I like, John Vanderslice quite a bit. Um, he's done a couple like live things, um, but so I've seen him in concert before too. And in concert, he always takes questions from people. Um, like he has, he writes them down uh, beforehand and he'll answer them on stage or, in the living room um, or whatever. And it's, uh, oh, um, Chairman thinks someone's mic isn't working. Can you hear me, Chairman? In the living room, um, oh, he can. And it's, so I'm, I just checked, my sound, the sound is on. Um, sorry, that threw me off a little bit. So anyways, so yeah, like uh, he is doing these things on Instagram Live now uh, and taking questions from people. And, you know, of course, a lot of the questions are about these things. It's not a direct political thing, even, um, even though sometimes it slides into that territory. Um, but it's creating this like community feeling and connection with people that is much more than your average, um, creator, uh, and viewer type of situation, which I think has some really positive implications. Um, if pop, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I just uh, maybe want to kind of come back uh, to the point uh, uh, that uh, Mike, you, you made about uh, which is kind of what we're discussing, what the, uh, we're discussing now. But uh, just to kind of uh, return a little bit and uh, say about uh, uh, which uh, I didn't think about it until now. Maybe as I wasn't as conscious uh, of the kind of peg distinction between the materialist position and the uh, uh, cultural position, uh, as some people have it, uh, think of it, and. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it's kind of the, it's the difference between these two positions is also in terms of uh, some people think that the changes are going to come in a kind of uh, uh, in one massive event, some, something similar to a revolution. Uh, uh, so uh, this kind of makes this process of culture uh, production uh, uh, pointless from from their point of view, or that this is not what people should be uh, doing. Uh, they should be organizing uh, uh, people directly. Uh, but uh, here I am 
in line with uh, Zizek and uh, what his idea of uh, change in society would be is a, a gradual change of uh, things into into the direction into the good direction or the direction that uh, we want R rather than these big events of uh, sudden changes that uh, very often lead to um, they lead to disappointments uh, where they uh, lead to even worse conditions so uh, and here we have now this online space and uh, we, we can uh, we can create culture in this space, something that we we couldn't do before uh, with the television uh, and the other mediums that were more restrictive. So uh, we have this opportunity, uh, and well, as you guys said, that we have to also be aware that the right wing is is trying to overtake uh, the kind of the, the narrative or the ideas that are present in the online space. And um, I think if, uh, if yeah, I'll speak to much. Okay, thanks for that concluding point, uh, Minai. And uh, thank you for all our listeners, viewers. Um, this has been a first edition of Beyond Linguistics, a reading group in which participants also respond with artworks. And we'll be back in one week so that will be uh friday the 10th okay um and then two weeks after that on april the 24th we will be starting with our reading of the dialectic of enlightenment do feel free to join us that will be chapter one and if you want to make an artwork in response and appear on this show we'll be happy to hear from you okay thanks guys thank you all thank you adam thanks mihai and see you all soon.